So, good morning. It is for the first time I'm doing a show in the morning. So this is very exciting times. We are doing our first shows live from Russia, which is really cool. And I've got two brilliant guests, one who is in Russia and one who's in England. So Paul Errington is joining us from England to do the history behind it. Morning, Paul. How are you? Morning, Paul. Morning, everyone. And Especially to those there. who are up in the middle of the night in the United States. Yeah, there's people watching. And, and out there in Russia for us is Mikhail. Good morning or good afternoon for you, Mikhail. It looks a little bit cold there. You've got snow coming a few kilometers away. Is that right? Yeah, good morning, guys. And uh, yeah, so uh, we expect uh, snow uh, about in two hours. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we. Well, we, we and Mikhail is on the banks of the Volga River. So we, we are we are beaming to you from Volga Grab. But all today during this show, we're going to refer to it by its name in World War Two, which was Stalingrad. So don't people email me and correct me. Yes, I know it's not Stalingrad anymore, but for the purposes of the day, we're going to call it Stalingrad. So um, and Mikhail and and Paul are both tour guides. Mikhail runs a company in Stalingrad, Volga Grad. There's links in the description below. You can contact him for tours. Paul, of course, works for Ledger and other organizations also doing tours to Russia. That's how they know each other. So we'll start with um, Paul. So what was happening um, uh, 78 years ago this week, Paul? Yeah, well, it's, uh, starting the show, really, we've got to put it into context with the dates we're actually covering, which obviously at the moment, 21st of November, um, because 78 years ago, the, we were currently in the uh, in the midst in the third day of Operation Uranus, which was the the large scale Russian counterattack uh, by the southwestern and Don fronts from the north, uh, and the uh, the Stalingrad front from the uh, from the south. And effectively, on the, on the early hours, well, roughly about nine o'clock in the morning on the nineteenth of November. Uh, the Southwestern Front began a counterattack out in the Great Bond Bend against the Romanian Third Army. Um, following a large uh, artillery and rocket preparation, they uh, attacked the, the Romanians uh, and forced a breach through the, the, the Romanian, uh, Romanian defences. With the purpose of, the whole purpose of this operation actually is obviously about cutting off the Sixth Army in Stalingrad. The following day, on the 20th of November, the 57th and 51st armies in the, uh, in the uh, uh, area of the Great Salt Lake to the south of Stalingrad began their offensive, again, roughly about the same time in the morning, slightly early. This is Russian time, I might add. Yeah. Um, their, uh, uh, their 13th mechanised and 4th mechanised corps uh, began assaulting the... Uh, the fourth Romanian army on the southern part of the, the, the largest Stalingrad front. So just taking us forward to today, the offence that started on the 20th, the second part of the offence started on different days, the 19th and the 20th. But the, the overall um, intention and aim of the operation was to trap the 6th Army and the two pincers to actually meet to collapse. Although there were operations moving inside that to try and trap the German formations. So the, uh, effectively, the, the Germans real, began to realise that the, uh, what was happening on the 20th Army Group B, uh, commanded by Baron von Weich, sent uh, signals to the 6th Army to prepare to attack this, uh, or counter-attack this uh, Russian assault. The Russians, the Germans, sorry, attacked on the 20th, uh, in the north, with the, particularly the 1st Romanian Panzer Division and the 22nd Panzer Division, and on the, in the south of the 29th Motorised Infantry Division, which had a, a, a tank battalion with it. But effectively, the, uh, the, the Russian assault was too strong, and by the, uh, the 22nd, the 26th Tank Corps had actually car uh, uh, captured the crossing at Kalach, which had been the German, main German crossing point, and... The following day, uh, elements of the 26th Tank Corps and the 4th Mechanised Brigade coming up from the south actually completely uh, closed the pocket behind the 6th Army at, uh, uh, at Sovetsky, just to the, uh, the south of the town of Kalach itself. So that's, that's, what was, that's just an overall picture of what was happening at the moment. Although, to be fair, the actual genesis of the ideas and the disaster for the 6th Army actually went back until, until the 12th of September. Yeah. Uh, during September, Stavka 
realising the potential because of the extended uh, and poorly defended German flanks, uh, started to formulate the plan of Operation Uranus. And then 12th of September, Paulus himself actually flew to Venice, head, uh, Hitler's headquarters for a conference, predominantly to talk about the actual assault on Stalingrad that we're going to go on to very shortly in the area that we're actually in, uh, the assault on the city itself, which began on the 13th. But the disaster began to unfold from that conference because during that conference, the, uh, the uh, discussion took place that the Serafimovich uh, and Tetskaya bridgehead over the Don, which was a major threat to the Germans, and is actually where the northern part of the assault was launched from. The Germans decided that they were going to capture Stalingrad before eliminating the bridgehead. So the disaster began to unfold then because what it left was the Russians with a large side bridgehead on the German side of the dawn from which the assault was carried out. Anyway, I'm not going to take, not trying to take too much time with history no, today that was, that, because that obviously was we want you to be able to see some of the sites in. Uh, in Stalingrad. But like I say, the 12th of September was a, uh, a pivotal day in many ways for what was actually happening now, 78 years ago. The other thing that happened on the 12th of September is the 62nd Army changed commanders on the infamous, uh, sorry, not infamous, the famous, although to some of his troops may be infamous, mm. General Chuikov actually took command of the 62nd Army, uh, 62nd Army and moved into his bunker in the Tsaritsa Gorge, in the southern part of the uh, city. At that point, about 800 metres from the front line. Uh, interestingly, at that point, Paulus himself uh, had never actually seen any part of Stalingrad. His headquarters were uh, uh, miles and miles and miles away out in the uh, uh, out in the steppe. And in fact, he didn't actually see Stalingrad until the, the 14th of September when he came forward to... Uh, um, General Sedlik's Kurzbach's headquarters, about five kilometres south of Gorodisha, looked through some donkey's ears, periscopes, and could see the smoke rising over Stalingrad in the distance. Anyway, I know Mikhail's, Mikhail's been showing us some shots of uh, the area that we're going to look at today, which is around the, uh, the, the Volga embankment, around the Grudin in well, let's, let's talk about the Volga now, Paul, and let's show yeah. people where we are as well, because... Mikhail, have you hold that shot on the river there for a moment, uh, Mikhail? That's brilliant. So let me show up the map that we're going to use today. This is, well, I showed this one. Uh, here's here's a map of Stalingrad. So we are right in the middle of it here, near where it says power plant. And they've got... Yeah, so that, that area the there, um, the, uh, it's the, uh, the city, if, if, if we can just orientate everybody, looking at the map, um, where it's got red square, government and party buildings, railroad station number one, that is the, the sort of... Um, the administrative and government and social centre of the city, and still is, still is. Yeah. Um, so, so Mikhail is looking so east across just, the yeah, Volga so, River. Yeah, so, and then you've got the Volga, you've obviously got the main railroad station and the uh, uh, the, the uh, railroad station number two to the south, which is where the, the, uh, the infamous uh, grain elevator is. So the area we're looking at today, everybody, is literally, as Paul pointed out, the, the, the area just to the, just to the north of the... Uh, the, the actual uh, uh, main red square area and government party building area, it's just up near the waterworks. Um, so not very far away, but, you know, a reasonably short walk from the city centre. And we're basically around, um, the, oh, that's a well, yeah, that's good. Yeah. We're basically here, We you can see, if people look off to the left of the map, you can see the, uh, the Uni Vermag store, which is off to, your, off to the top left of the map. Yeah. Um, that's, of course, the the famous store where uh, Paulus uh, uh, eventually surrendered. And then you've got, the you, you get top left of your map, you've got the railway station. So we're just a couple of city blocks up, really, if you uh, want to put it in American terms. And you can see the 9th of January square. So that was a large square area. Uh, just in front of, which was basically the mill, the Grudin uh, uh, flour mill. And the way we, where we're actually, actually on the embankment is, you can see Rodimtsev's wall, named after uh, Alexander Rodimtsev, commander of the 13th Guards Rifle Division, that landed in this area, uh, well, began to land on the afternoon of the 14th of September. Uh, elements so into the city centre. Um, the Germans had carried out a major attack 
on the 14th. They'd actually done the preparatory work on the 13th by capturing areas from the outskirts of the, uh, the city, particularly in this area, the 295th Infantry Division. General Wolfman's uh, 2-9 Infantry Division had captured the, the flying school and the barracks uh, and the aerodrome and basically set up as a logistic base for the assault into the city on the 14th. Into the centre of the city, around uh, 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 the Red Square area, was set the 71st Infantry Division, uh, commanded by General Hartman. They were all part of Sadlick's curve back to 51st Corps. And yeah. it's, an, it's an interesting aside that uh, actually because of the uh, the extension, the huge extension of Sixth Army's front into the Great Don Bend and south of the, uh, the Salt Lakes, that Paulus was actually being forced to attack the city with what, with what was basically his weakest core. 71st, 295 and 389 infantry divisions have been pretty much worn down as most of the German units either fighting to actually reach Stalingrad in the first place. So I'm going to bring, thank you very much, Paul. I'm going to bring in Mikhail for a bit now because Mikhail is yeah. a local guy. So Mikhail, tell us, a little, while you're, while you're um, showing us around, tell us a little bit about um, the Volga and the importance of the, of the Volga River to getting uh, Russian troops into the area and about the embankments and the ravines on the river. T -t Describe a bit the geography to us. Uh, well, uh, Volga River is uh, one of the, the longest uh, rivers of the world, and uh, this is uh, uh, 300, uh, 3,500 kilometers long, approximately. So Volga is the very vital and important uh, way for the uh, barges uh, and uh, to, uh, transporting roads of uh, all of the goods uh, of, uh, in Russia still uh, now, nowadays. So uh, you can see a lot of barges on the Volga River moving uh, right now. So the same was in, uh, uh, much more uh, during the Battle of Stalingrad. Uh, produced uh, vehicles, tanks, oil was coming from the Caucasus uh, uh, north of uh, Russia to such cities as uh, to Moscow and uh, that direction. So that was uh, one of the reasons... Uh, 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 Hitler wanted to, to uh, capture the, uh, the, the city of Stalingrad, including the industry. So that is why, uh, as uh, Paul already said, uh, the uh, 13th Guards Rifle Division of Rodimtsev uh, uh, started uh, the crossing uh, the Volga River on, on 14th, uh, from 14th to 15th of September 1942. So we can see uh, the opposite banks uh, of Volga River, where we located the troops of uh, Rodimtsev of 13th Guards Rifle Division, uh, where they started that uh, famous uh, 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 brave uh, uh, crossing of uh, the Volga. Uh, so the um, uh, width of the Volga River in the area where we are is approximately one kilometer and a half uh, meters, uh, 1,500 uh, uh, meters. So uh, these, uh, this is uh, quite, uh, yeah, you understand what, uh, what was uh, it looked like to cross the Volga River under the uh, enemy, uh, enemy's shelling, uh, uh, yeah, 24 hour shelling. So, but uh, uh, late uh, morning or uh, yeah, late night, uh, the division uh, fortunately was able to cross the Volga River and arrive right here. So behind me, uh, there is a uh, 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 there is a street named uh, uh, after the 13th Guards Rifle Division, which landed here, and uh, 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 we can see uh, here the uh, uh, complex of uh, Panorama Museum, the Battle of Stalingrad, uh, which is one of the greatest uh, uh, museums of uh, Russia. So this is a very big and has a thousand of the different exponates, personal belongings of Russian, German soldiers, and including, of course, the uh, very interesting uh, uh, pictorial canvas, the defeat of the German Nazi forces in uh, Stalingrad. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but uh, let's return uh, back to the Volga River. Uh, yeah, Paul? 
So, yeah, Paul, explain about how the banks of the river itself are very important, because it's quite steep, isn't mm -hmm. it? There's, you know, there's sort of 50 metres or so. Talk about the uh, the dugouts and the ravines and things they uh -huh. called it, because oh, it, yeah. was a, it was an important staging point, wasn't it, Paul? So explain a little bit about that for us while, while we've got Mekal shots there. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the photos you showed actually are very indicative of the of the, the Volga embankment and how uh, how important it was. It's uh, I mean just to follow up a little bit of what uh, Miguel just said. The the, the, uh, the the four things the Germans penetrated into the city and in fact linked the Volga in two locations. One of which was quite close to where we are at the moment. Um, Infantry Regiment Five One Eight from the Two Nine Five Infantry Division actually got to the Volga bank. So. It was a crisis situation for the Russians. Rodimsev actually crossed over to the city, conferred with Chuikov, and they made the decision that instead of crossing on the night, the, the 42nd Guards were going to come storming across the river on the late afternoon of the 14th. And that's what they did. And they, this area that Mikhail's showing now, uh, they, they came across in the uh, assault boats. They were under, Mikhail says they were under horrendous German fire, artillery, machine guns, mortars, anti-tank guns firing out at the um, uh, the boats crossing. But they landed and basically stormed up the embankment, up to the top. And, and Mikhail, again, giving a great shot there that shows you the actual height of the embankment is dropping down to the actual river. So 42nd Guards actually stormed into the city centre uh, and push the Germans back. They basically, in many ways, the critical point for Stalin the capture of the city of Kuhl and the 13th Guards deployed in and pushed the Germans back. Gave Chuikov and Rodimsev breathing space to actually get over the, to get the rest of the division over the river, about 10,000 men, during the night of the 14th into the 15th. And then they moved up. Elements of 39th Guards Regiment moved up into the area we are now with the panorama and around the mill and retook it from the Germans. But the, the, the state of the embankment, of course, once the Germans had been pulled up, pushed away from the embankment, meant that they, had, they didn't have direct observation. So although crossing the Volga was still an extremely dangerous occupation and thousands of men uh, and, thou and, and civilians as well crossing the other way, lost their lives crossing the river, because the Germans didn't have direct observation, of the riverbank to allow the Russians to develop the riverbank into basically a series of command bunkers, defensive bunkers, log new, uh, the logistical supply unit could set up on the riverbank and, and be relatively safe from German artillery fire because obviously it wasn't observed fire anymore. So the, the actual crossing of the, the 13th Guards Rifle Division and the capture of the city, the, the city banks and the, and the embankment and pushing the Germans away from the river really can't be understated in the uh, in the overall uh, conduct of the battle that, went, that then went on until, uh, well, obviously up until the end of, uh, uh, well, beginning of February 43. Yeah, and we must stress to people watching that we are only seeing a very, very tiny part of the city today, and we're only covering a very small part of the, the battle. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. These are very much intended as introductions, because we've got, with you know, Mikhail is there on hand for us, and with the help of donations and things like that coming via Patreon, we can get make out. I'm buying him a stabilizer for his phone for the next shows, and we can we can do more of this because it's an extraordinary battlefield, and it's you know not many people can get the chance to travel there, especially no. this year with COVID. So this is fantastic being able to show the live footage but obviously it doesn't take much to look at where we will look at my Mikhail's shot there obviously the city has been in largely rebuilt um but we're going towards now one of the existing buildings that that survived the battle and is left now as a monument you can't actually go inside the building anymore though Mikhail has sent some photos of when he went inside it a couple of years ago but that is the flour mill there paul uh, paul so tell us about that building significance and uh, I'll, I'll while while you're talking i'll put up some photos of it at the time yeah, the flour mill became significant. I mean, like you say, the, the 39th Guards uh, Rifle Regiment actually recaptured it. And it's interesting when you read their history, it, it said it was actually captured in bitter and pitiless close combat. Um, many of the Stalingrad buildings in the city centre were buildings, obviously, of very, of, of very high stories. Uh, and the mill, the mill was no exception. Yeah, there's uh, some good photos of it, uh, the way it looked during the uh, uh, the battle itself. Um, and of course, those they could be turned into fortresses, so they were important for both sides. 
buildings like the mill. Um, all the floors could be utilized. Quite often they had large cellars as well. So this, this actually drew the Germans into what, became, what the Germans called the Rattenkrieg, the rats, the war of the rats. Um, but all these buildings could be established as actual strong points. So there's Mikhail up on one of the top floors showing the, the view that he gave. Uh, and this is how the, the urban fighting began to develop in buildings like this. This one here, actually, the mill uh, um, uh, was uh, used by Rogimsev as uh, one of his headquarters buildings. And obviously the, uh, the actual... Uh, the mill itself was a firing point because um, in front of it, uh, we're going to obviously do the second show with Pavlov's house, but in front of it were a number of buildings within the quite open area of the 9th of January Square. But if Mikhail, uh, if Mikhail uh, sort of turns round to you, uh, can we just go left, Mikhail, so we got a view down the river? Yeah, can you show us back towards the river from where you are, Mikhail? That's going to be a good view. Then we'll go back to the mill and turn round towards the river. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm heading right now to to the Volga River, and uh, it is just in a few hundred meters, and we'll see the river just in a second. Yeah, and we should point out there's that 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 fountain in front of the flour mill today, but that's not the original fountain. That's one they built for the 2013 film Stalingrad, the Russian made film, which they kind of moved there. It was, it was in, it was in another part of the city, but I'll show a photo. It's the statue that everyone knows it's in, yeah. it's in all the iconic images and the films and computer games. And there's now this replica one in front of the flour mill of, of, of the children, you know, dancing around there. And it's, you know, that one of those iconic images, but, um, yeah, so Mikhail is, you know, the, the, because he's on top of the building there, you get a real idea of the width of the river, the size of the the the, the crossing point there, the 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 enormity of the city, frankly. And you've been there many times, haven't you, Paul? Now, and I mean, I'm sure it's one yeah, of those places. Yeah. Every time you go, you discover a little bit more of it. And uh, uh, like anywhere else, like Normandy or the Ardennes, you you start with learning one bit, and you go back, you learn more and more and more. So there's a lot more we can do on these shows. But there's the Volga now. So um, mm. Incredible, as, as, as Mikhail said, one of the longest rivers in the world. And, you know, there is a lot of uh, new construction around there now. But then you've also got that original flour mill, which, you know, incredibly iconic of the fighting there. So, um, you know, tell yeah, us a little I mean, bit about... Just, just, just to sort of interrupt the a second there, Paul. Yeah, sure. Give people a perspective. I mean, now getting a good perspective here, everybody. Obviously, Mikhail's shown us the river, which is just behind him now. Um the large building beyond the mill uh, is where we're going to do the second half of our show, but you can see that's, that's actually the, the area of 9th of January Square. That was the front line, everybody. So from the river, which is just behind the hill and just down the embankment from the panorama to the front line. Now, that was, that was in, in areas, it was roughly, roughly about 500 metres. In some areas, as you can see from the large map, it was actually less. Yeah. Um, so they, the Russians were holding on to literally hundreds, just a few hundred metres of ground um, inland from the, the embankment. And um, the, the, it shows the, 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 the actual uh, length that they actually held this was for most of the battle. This area was actually held for most of the battle. The Germans actually didn't reach the Volga Bank again in this area. Uh, oh, great, great photos showing you uh, of the actual interior of the, of the, of the, of the, of the city, uh, following obviously the bombing and the fighting and the way that obviously the, the, was littered, the whole city was littered with trenches, communication trenches, bunkers, um, obviously the taller buildings used by snipers, um, even mortar crews, anti-tank gun crews, mortars and anti-tank guns dragged into the higher floors to get better angles of, uh, and fields of fire because obviously because of all the rubble in the city centre, fields of fire were very limited. I often compare it a bit to the Bokkars in Normandy, Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, same thing, very limited fields of fire, very limited observation. Um, and it really is, I'm just, sorry to interrupt you now, it really is an infantryman's battle, isn't it? There are some oh, numbers of tanks, yeah. anti-tank yeah. guns, and there's some air power is involved as well. But with the front lines being so close together, it, 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 is, it is how it is portrayed in the movies. It is the sewers and building to building and floor to floor. Yeah. And the Russians oh, hold one so, yeah. floor, the Germans hold the other floor. And, it, you know, it is, 
every soldier's nightmare of, ha ha of, of fighting, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, I mean, very, very much so. I mean, uh, what happened really is, is, you know, the bombing of the city uh, beginning on the 23rd of August when the uh, the famous dash across the Volga land on Volga language took place by uh, uh, 14th Panzer Corps. Um, from then onwards, the, the, the Germans began to lose their advantage as they advanced into the industrial areas, into the, into the, into the populated city centre, uh, where all these buildings were. Yeah, that's where we have to pitch up there, everybody, because it shows you number six is the mill. Yeah. The two, the two buildings highlighted in, uh, on top of the mill are actually where we're going to go for our next session, Pavlos House. But then you can see how open the 9th of January Square was. Well, that's 9th of January Square there. It, and, but right at the top of the photo, you can actually see the railway line yeah. uh, coming in. So again, you can see how a restricted combat area it was. And as the Germans moved in there, like Paul says, it very much became an infantry battle because... The German army's traditional tactics of going through reconnaissance and then the bombers go in, the Stukas or the heavy bombers go in, obliterate the opposition, the Panzers go in with the Panzer and the Panzer Grenadiers, etc. with the infantry. All that was negated because now, because the front lines were literally sometimes just separate, the Germans and Russians were sometimes separated by just the floor of the buildings after they back into the main square. Area, the floor of the buildings, um, the, the bombing, the chances are that the front line is so close that if you carried out uh, large scale bombing, you're going to hit your own fellas. Artillery observation was very limited, so artillery fire from the German side coming from um, way back into the steppe outside the city or on the borders of the city, again, was quite often unobserved. Your chances of shelling your own blokes. And the Russians had the advantage there all there or after he was all on the right uh, bank of the river. Um, and they had uh, they took all the high buildings obviously to be able to observe the Germans better. But um, yeah, so the Germans began to lose all the advantages that they had and were drawn into basically urban close combat where their heavy firepower and their tactical and strategic advantage was completely lost. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah. Say, Paul, it came down to a complete and utter man against man infantry battle. And, and you have to say that the, the Russians must have had that advantage as well in a sense of defending their homeland, where the Germans oh, are yeah, an incredibly yeah. long way from home. Yeah. Uh, no creature comforts. I mean, no, no, the Russians had no creature comforts either, but they, it's that you get that in all wars when you're defending your homeland, like the Germans themselves defending Berlin three years yeah. later. You know, well, everyone very, fights very more desperately sure. the for their own. And, and of course, the. Uh, I mean, motivation. I mean, uh, one of the things Tuikov did introduce was was uh, iron discipline. He's um, he followed the, uh, the infamous "not one step back" order. And in fact, when Thirteen Guards came over, one of their uh, mottoes was that uh, there, are, there is no land for us beyond the Volga. In other words, once you were into Stalingrad, you weren't going back onto the eastern bank uh, unless, obviously, you were dead or victorious. And yeah. Chuikov, there's an interesting little anecdote. Chuikov actually, um, uh, within the day of taking over, he had the commander and commissar from one of the rifle regiments shot for cowardice in front of his, in front of the regiment. And they, they began to instill this iron discipline into the soldiers anyway. But, but you're right, Paul, I, in some ways, whether they need to do that or not, I'm not sure, because the motivation to fight for your own country uh, was obviously huge for the, for the Russian soldiers. Yeah, and while we've got Mikhail, so Mikhail is looking at some of the, uh, the 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 artifacts there. So there's the boat over to the right. Well, there's a there's a obviously we've got artillery and armored vehicles things there, but it's the boat I'm particularly interested in as well because that's one of the ones representative to the right there of how the 13th Guards were, were, were brought across. You know, some came across in kind of converted barges and almost like um, um, conventional kind of ships, but others just came across in barges, towed behind others. So it was a mm -hmm. And a kilometre and a half of, of under fire, terrible stuff. So, um, Mikhail, tell us a little bit from a, from a local's point of view about how important that area is to, to, to in, in Russian memory today. You know, the Volga there and the flour mill. What, what, do pe what do Russians think when they see those remains now? Uh, so, uh, uh, first of all, uh, of course, uh, this uh, ruined uh, meal was left as a reminder of those uh, horrors of war which uh, uh, 
happened uh, on the banks of the Volga River. So uh, after the Battle of Stalingrad uh, was uh, decided to leave a few of such buildings, not to forget those uh, terrible uh, days and uh, the, uh, as I said, horrors of war. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, at the Tehran's conference uh, in 1943, uh, Churchill, uh, Prime Minister of the Great Britain, uh, offered uh, to Joseph Stalin not to uh, rebuild the city uh, after, the, uh, after the battle and to leave it uh, as a, a big uh, memorial complex and a uh, reminder of... Uh, uh, yeah, suffering, as, yeah. Uh, yeah, suffering. Yeah, but uh, Stalin said no. Uh, Germans uh, ruined uh, the city of Stalingrad and they will uh, rebuild it. And uh, only a few buildings uh, 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 they decided to leave, such as uh, this uh, uh, ruined uh, flour mill, uh, uh, which was the observation point of the uh, 13th Guards Rifle uh, Division. We also have the laboratory of the Red October uh, Steelworks factory, which also uh, reminds about those uh, uh, days. Uh, and of course, uh, the uh, command point of uh, uh, Ivan Ludnikov uh, uh, at the Island of Fire uh, near the Barricade gun factory. I hope we will do another show when... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, everyone can us, see these uh, buildings as well. We had a couple yeah. of questions, Mikhail, about the about the fountain, the statue there, the replica that mm -hmm. you're looking at there. So, mm -hmm. why why are why are there children dancing around a crocodile? What was the what's the symbolism of the original design? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, the symbolism of this uh, design is uh, 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 before the war. There was a uh, interesting. Uh, a uh, fairy tale of uh, the uh, Soviet uh, writer Korney Chukovsky. Uh, uh, this uh, fa fairy tale tells about uh, how the children went to Africa. Uh, their parents told them uh, not to go there uh, because uh, Africa is a dangerous uh, place. Yeah, but uh, you know, children, they always uh, go uh, uh, off somewhere and don't tell uh, their parents. So. This uh, time they went to Africa, and of course, uh, the uh, 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 strange things ha started to happen to them. So the crocodile ate uh, the sun, and uh, it became dark, and the children started dancing around the crocodile and asked him to speed the sun uh, back. Uh, yeah, so, uh, 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 but uh, the crocodile didn't want to give the sun and uh, the uh, bad uh, African guy came uh, with a knife, a knifed uh, crocodile and the sun came, uh, came back and it be became uh, again uh, uh, light and uh, funny. So the uh, uh, children were dancing about, uh, around the crocodile asking him uh, uh, to let the sun, to speed the sun uh, uh, back and uh, dancing and uh, singing the songs right. yeah well, it's, so it's nice to uh, know that uh, Russian, yeah mm -hmm. so it's right it's nice to know that russian fairy tales are just as disturbing as western fairy tales <laughs> yeah most of them are yeah. pretty horrific but, the grim yeah. tales is, yeah but uh, but the soviet uh, uh, ch really. so, so soviet children so liked the, these uh, uh, story these fairy tales so such uh, fountains uh, uh, became uh, uh, very popular in Soviet Union. You could see them not only in Stalingrad, uh, you could see in uh, Petty, uh, Petty Gorsk in uh, Stalingrad and a few more uh, city, cities. They were, mm. uh, th they were the same, yes, yeah. the same. But the well, well, in, is, our, in yeah. our second show later, yeah. we'll be talking about all the statues of Lenin, of course, that Russia has yeah. as well. So there's certain uh -huh. similar things. Yeah. Like in but, France, but, but, every, but, every town has a Rue Charles de Gaulle. That's, there's yeah. General de Gaulle Road. Every single town has one. Mm -hmm. So we're going to we have to end this stream so soon because we've got another one coming up in, an, in 25 minutes, Paul. But any Anything that you want, either we want to say to bring this show to an end about the area around here, or should we save it all for the Pavlov's house show? Anything you want to particularly say, either of you? 
Uh, well, I think just, just to reiterate, you know, the, uh, the this this area was so vital to actually initial defence of the city. Um, yeah. If Thirteenth Guards hadn't retaken the area along the the, the embankment, um, then the, the really important thing was there was actually four main crossings over the river that we used: two in the central area uh, and one at the rear of the uh, Red October factory. The crossings were actually lost. But the securing of the embankments in uh, in these areas actually what won't allow obviously the Soviets to, to feed in other divisions. So yeah. after thirteenth guards, other divisions. Just, I mean, in, 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 interrupt you for a second, Paul. Just talk about the rockets for a second. Well, okay. Mick, I'll put it put the image back on the rocket truck there for a second because that's that's an important aspect of it from both sides. Yeah. The Germans yeah. with their Nebel Werfers, but the rockets because. Correct me if I'm wrong, Paul. They had some of these rockets not on the trucks like that, but had them also in some of the dugouts in the in the uh, in the banks, so they could bring them out very quickly, yeah, farther, and bring did. them back they, under um, cover again. Yeah, the the Katyusha, the famous rocket, Russian uh, rocket launchers, little Kate, it was, it was, um devastating uh, firepower. I mean, a bit like uh, obviously the German naval burst, and later on, we you know in the war in the West, we introduced the uh, mattress, the, the uh, uh, rocket launches, but de delivering tons of firepower and, uh, and rocket firepower into a small area very quickly. But you're right, what happened here was the one we could fire from the left bank, um, sorry, the, the right bank of the river, the east bank of the river, but what they did was they transported them over and back the embankments were big enough to actually move them into bunkers and they would back them out in a specially prepared position so they could get the elevation to fire over the top of the bank, over the top of the buildings, and actually into the German occupied areas of the city. Uh, and yeah, the, uh, the Katyusha uh, played a large part in, uh, in, in holding the Germans in the city and preventing them from actually getting onto the bank. The, uh, these areas were vital for that sort of action, bringing artillery over, bringing equipment. In the, also feeding of other divisions in to just hang on, hang on long enough for what was happening 78 years ago today, Operation Uranus, to actually take place. Well, that's a nice way to bring this port to now. Hang on desperately till the next till the next show. We'll say that to our viewers as well. So, Mikhail, Paul, that was fantastic stuff. We said we'd be about 30 minutes, but about 37. We'll, we'll stop this stream now. And then folks watching, join us again in 22 minutes. We'll do the second part of the story a couple of hundred yards away where we'll talk about the epic fighting for Pavlov's house and what happened. And we'll continue the story. So we hope you're enjoying it. So um, we will see you all again soon in 22 minutes. So... Uh, Thank you very much, guys. I'll end this stream now and we'll see you so shortly. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great. Right, great. so we'll end this one.